The new discovery of hominin fossils dated to 773,000 years ago at Thomas Quarry near Casablanca has been presented as a cornerstone for a renewed African-centered narrative of human origins. The study repeatedly emphasizes an African lineage basal to Homo sapiens while simultaneously acknowledging morphological mosaics, geographic overlap, and episodic contact across the Strait of Gibraltar. The study by Hublin et al., titled Early Hominins from Morocco Basal to the Homo sapiens Lineage, shows that Morocco was home to a population that was ancestral to the later Jebel Irhud, early Homo sapiens, that lived 300,000 years ago in Morocco. This is an extremely important find, proving that Morocco, and by extension, North Africa, were home to ancestral Homo sapiens continuously from nearly 800,000 years ago. However, when the author's statements are read closely, a series of internal tensions emerges, especially concerning whether early Homo sapiens-like populations can be meaningfully isolated within Africa rather than understood as part of a wider Mediterranean metapopulation. At the heart of the study lies a claim of extraordinary significance. The Thomas Quarry hominins provide strong evidence for an African lineage ancestral to our species. This conclusion, however, rests uneasily alongside multiple admissions that population structure, mobility, and interregional exchange characterized the early and middle Pleistocene Mediterranean world. For example, the summary paragraph of the study easily collapses under the weight of its own geographic sleight of hand. The study claims that securely dated pre-90,000 year old Homo sapiens fossils were found either in Africa or at the gateway to Asia performing a conceptual erasure of the Levant, treating it as a corridor rather than what it demonstrably is, an integrated part of the Mediterranean North African Levantine biogeographic system. This phrasing is not neutral, it is rhetorical, designed to preserve an African origin narrative by redefining inconvenient fossils as marginal, transitional or just outside Africa. This statement buries the dozens of well-dated early Homo sapiens from outside of Africa, including Apidema, Mislaya, Kesem, Tabun, Skul, Kafse, Amud, Zutia, and others. These populations were stable, thriving populations that existed for at least 300,000 years. They were not recent migrants from Africa. The Levant is not a gateway in the way implied here. It is not a narrow funnel separating two worlds. It is ecologically, climatically, and archaeologically intertwined with North Africa, sharing faunal turnovers, lithic traditions, burial practices, and hominin populations over hundreds of thousands of years. To treat Levantine fossils as peripheral evidence, while elevating Moroccan finds as proof of a uniquely African lineage, is to draw an artificial boundary that exists only to protect a prior conclusion. More telling is what is excluded. Sub-Saharan Africa, repeatedly invoked as the presumed homeland of Homo sapiens, is not part of this Mediterranean system at all. It is separated by major ecological barriers, the Sahara chief among them, that repeatedly fragmented populations and limited sustained north-south exchange. If geographic continuity mattered, the Levant should be grouped with North Africa long before sub-Saharan Africa is invoked as the default source population. The argument, therefore, hinges on a contradiction. Geography is used when it supports an African origin and ignored when it does not. Levantine fossils are downgraded to gateways, while Moroccan fossils are elevated to basal ancestry, despite both occupying the same Mediterranean interaction zone. This is not an evidence-driven conclusion. It is a narrative maneuver, one that recasts interconnected populations as separate when convenient and unified when necessary, in order to preserve the idea that Homo sapiens must originate in Africa, even when the data repeatedly show a broader, Mediterranean-wide evolutionary network. The authors repeatedly stress that the Moroccan fossils exhibit a mixture of archaic and derived traits. The mandibles and teeth show affinities with Homo erectus, Homo antecessor, Neanderthals, and Homo sapiens. This is explicitly acknowledged. These fossils are similar in age to Homo antecessor, yet are morphologically distinct, displaying a combination of primitive traits and of derived features reminiscent of later Homo sapiens and Eurasian archaic hominins. 
Indeed, such mosaic morphology is precisely what one would expect in a geographically broad, interconnected population spread across North Africa and Southern Europe. Yet the study repeatedly channels this complexity back into a geographically constrained African narrative. The fossils are described as basal to Homo sapiens, but not clearly ancestral, connected to Europe, but not part of a shared Eurasian African population, involved in exchanges, but still framed as fundamentally African. This conceptual tension is never resolved. Instead, it is rhetorically managed. The authors admit that there probably wasn't one population that gave rise to the human lineage. There probably were lots of populations in various places. Yet the conclusion insists that these populations ultimately reinforce a deep African origin and is geographically incoherent. The last common ancestor of these lineages was likely present on both sides of the Mediterranean at that time and was already diverging, said Dr. Hublin. This supports a deep African ancestry for Homo sapiens and argues against Eurasian origin scenarios that have been proposed by some authors. In the past, Hublin has accused the proponents of Out of East Africa of using biased evidence and ignoring evidence from North Africa that didn't fit their Garden of Eden origin theory. The geographic location of Morocco is also a problem for strictly out-of-Africa origins. It is at the end of the African Mediterranean world, so unless these hominins were crossing the Strait of Gibraltar in boats 800,000 years ago, it means they were passing through the Levant, and this suggests a Mediterranean origin for early Homo sapiens, spanning Spain to the Levant to Morocco. Stone tools in Morocco have been found dating to 1.3 million years, suggesting a very long, continuous hominin occupation of the region. If multiple populations existed across North Africa and Southern Europe, exchanging genes and traits throughout the Mediterranean, then the insistence on isolating an African lineage becomes increasingly artificial. The fossils from Morocco begin to look less like a uniquely African route and more like one regional expression of a larger Mediterranean metapopulation. Chris Stringer at the Natural History Museum in London stated it was unclear on which continent the last common ancestor lived. However, even if the last common ancestor lived outside of Africa, our analyses indicated that the later evolution of Homo sapiens still took place in Africa. So in that case, there would have been an early migration into Africa to continue that evolution. Clement Zanoli, an anthropologist with the French University of Bordeaux, also agrees the fossil's evolutionary position remains unsettled. Whether these hominins do position at the base of Homo sapiens is really tricky to say for now, because we have so few fossils in all of Africa. This admission directly contradicts the most Homo sapiens fossils are in Africa statement. John Hawkes, a biological anthropologist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, also agreed with the researchers' conclusions. It's clear from the new study that these fossils don't fit easily into the variation of Homo erectus in some ways. It's likely that they're close to the common ancestor that gave rise to Neanderthals, Denisovans and modern people. In my way of thinking, they might be the earliest fossils that we should really call Homo sapiens, Hawkes said. John Hawkes has also argued that there is no evidence of Homo sapiens living in southern Africa before 260,000 years ago. Perhaps the most provocative element of the discussion is the suggestion, raised by some commentators and cautiously echoed in the paper, that the Thomas Quarry fossils might represent very early Homo sapiens. If this interpretation is even partially correct, then the implications are profound. A Homo sapiens-like population at 773,000 years ago cannot plausibly be confined to a narrow African refuge. Such a population would have existed during a time of demonstrated Mediterranean connectivity, Aculean technological continuity, and widespread faunal exchange. In this light, the question shifts. Why assume that these early sapiens-like hominins were exclusively African? Why not consider them part of a broader Mediterranean population stretching from Morocco through Iberia and into the Levant? The Levant, after all, repeatedly appears as a corridor rather than a boundary in later periods. If populations could move freely between Africa and Southwest Asia after 60,000 years ago, it is difficult to argue that earlier populations were more constrained. 
to believe that Morocco is somehow connected to sub-Saharan Africa, while not being connected to the Mediterranean, requires a suspension of all knowledge of geography, biology, and common sense. One of the most striking contradictions in the paper concerns the Strait of Gibraltar. On the one hand, the authors clearly accept the possibility, indeed the likelihood, of crossings during the early Pleistocene. They state that similarities between Moroccan fossils and Spanish Homo antecessor revive the question of possible exchanges across the Strait of Gibraltar during the early Pleistocene. Elsewhere, they go further, noting that the last common ancestor of these lineages was likely present on both sides of the Mediterranean at that time. If this is so, then Gibraltar cannot be treated as a hard biogeographic boundary at 773,000 years ago. The Mediterranean, in this framing, becomes a shared evolutionary theatre rather than a dividing line. Yet later interpretations of human evolution routinely reintroduce Gibraltar as a decisive barrier when discussing younger time periods, when early Homo sapiens are said to have failed to enter Europe or to have done so only episodically. This raises a fundamental question. How can Gibraltar be crossable nearly one million years ago, but not 100,000 years ago? The study provides no satisfactory ecological or technological explanation for this reversal. If archaic hominins with Aculean technologies could traverse the strait during the early Pleistocene, it becomes difficult to argue that later populations, equipped with more advanced cognitive, social and technological capacities, were suddenly constrained by an insurmountable maritime barrier. They could more easily have crossed the Strait of Sicily to Italy during low sea levels, which could explain the enigmatic soprano skull. Either way, saying that an African origin is more likely than a Eurasian origin is biologically absurd. The most likely scenario is a pan-Mediterranean origin spanning both Africa and Eurasia. The study concludes by asserting that the Moroccan fossils reinforce the case for an African rather than a Eurasian ancestry of Homo sapiens. Yet this conclusion appears less the inevitable outcome of the data than a preservation of a preferred framework. The same evidence could be read differently, as support for a pan-Mediterranean population structure in which Africa, Europe and the Near East participated in shared evolutionary processes. The repeated emphasis on Africa as origin contrasts sharply with the author's own admissions of regional differentiation, gene flow, and morphological overlap. The fossils do not cleanly resolve the question of origins. Instead, they complicate it. They suggest that the emergence of Homo sapiens traits was not confined to a single continent, but unfolded across a network of connected populations. Another inconsistency arises in the discussion of environmental barriers. Europe is treated as a separate evolutionary arena, only intermittently accessible. The logic is asymmetric. Africa is porous and dynamic. Europe is bounded and resistant. The Moroccan fossils undermine this asymmetry. Their similarities to Homo antecessor suggest that Europe and North Africa were part of a single ecological and evolutionary system, at least episodically, during the early Pleistocene. The Moroccan fossils at 773,000 years ago are undeniably important. They fill a genuine gap in the fossil record and illuminate a poorly understood period of human evolution. But they also expose unresolved contradictions in how barriers and corridors are invoked. Gibraltar cannot simultaneously be a bridge at one million years ago and a wall at 100,000 years ago without a compelling explanatory mechanism. If early hominins crossed, exchanged and diversified across the Mediterranean during the early Pleistocene, then the most parsimonious interpretation is not strict African isolation, but Mediterranean integration. Indeed, the Moroccan fossils show there was continuity across North Africa and the Levant for 200,000 years, both in skull morphology and tool industries. Meanwhile, there is zero continuity between East Africa and the Levant, the gateway to Asia. In this view, the Thomas Quarry hominins are not simply African ancestors of Homo sapiens. They are participants in a wider population spanning North Africa, Southern Europe, and likely the Middle East, a population from which later Homo sapiens, Neanderthals, and Denisovans all ultimately emerged. Thanks for watching.